as soon as they get the audio fixed, I'll say welcome to everyone out there in television land. Um, I brought a few things to start out with. This is still too, too, too much, Mike. How's that? A little better. Yeah, okay. Uh, still sounds pretty loud to me. <clears throat> now, uh, let's see. First of all, I got some, some good news. Um, and actually, I don't have any bad news, so that's nice. Um, I've got, um, coming up, I've lined up six guest speakers uh, for this course, uh, especially at the part where you're, you're going to be really tired of listening to me uh, in the end of November. I hope you'll, you'll still uh, f find me not too boring in the middle of November. But now on, um, uh, actually, you see, what is it, two weeks or so from today, the, uh, the 28th, we'll will be our first guest speaker, Herb Wilf, the current editor of the Math Monthly, will talk. Then, uh, can we have this on the screen? Um, and then on November 18th, Jeff Allman is going to talk. Um, anyone, anyone in computer science has probably read at least 10 of Jeff's books. Uh, Leslie Lamport will be talking on, on the next day, and then uh, Nils Nelson, and then Mary, Mary Claire Van Lunen, the day before Thanksgiving. Uh, this will be, uh, what's wrong with that? Oh, she, well, you'll be on tape. Um, it, yeah, um, now, um, Mary Claire sort of wants to, wants to bring, you know, be able to rebut anyone else without having a chance of anybody else getting at, getting at her, I guess. Um, now, before this, uh, uh, before these, these these talks, I'll be t I'll be handing out some examples of things that these people have written uh, that, uh, that I think is pretty good, and we can and we'll take we'll be looking at this a little bit. Um, <clears throat> let me show you something that I got from Herb today. Actually, he's um, it's just a, it's just a, a sample of a letter that he that he sent out to his editorial board at the Math Monthly, and he and he's asking for for their advice. Uh, what is your opinion? He says, please check one box um, and return to me in the next couple of weeks. Thanks. Yes, run it. No, not appropriate. Three, Wilf is losing his marbles. Must be the California sunshine. Uh, I don't know. I thought that was a good example of Herb's style, and it's a fairly good way to run business letters, if you ask me. <laughs> okay. Could, could um, put it in, in um, use it in exercises in a text, too, I guess is an idea. Well, let's see. Other other things left over from in the old business category. I found out that there were that there were um, two of the assignments that you turned in that I still had uh, wanted to show on screen, um, even though I promised never to look at L of C and P again. Um, I did want to show the the uh, just the idea of variety of sentence style um, as. Uh, uh, any sentence is okay, but if you use the same style over and over again, it does get repetitive. So here we have a however, comma, in addition, comma, so, comma, as a result, comma, thus, comma. Um, five sentences in a row, all with the same, all with the same, you know, short, comma, and so on. Uh, you can do much, you can do better by, by, by using variety. Let's see, here was, a, I think, another one here. Um, person like to say following. We have the following inequality. We obtain the following contradicting inequality. Now, we pointed out that use of parallelism is is better than than variety in some cases when the parallelism is an important thing. But here, but here, and also uh, uh, here was uh, we have the following relation. It seems to be a uh, it seems to be a, a habit. Now, <clears throat> I'm afraid to watch my TV films of this for fear that I have some tick or something, some habit that I repeat over and over again, and I probably do. That. That's probably very annoying, and, and, uh, and as a professional, I should really examine it and learn it and correct this. If I, maybe I say hopefully all the time or basically or something. But um, uh, when, you, when you look at your own writing, look for, look for cases where you've, uh, where you've gotten into a rut. Uh, that, can be, that can make it boring. Let's see. Now, let's, I, I told you about the book designer. Let me show you what what, the, what I got from the book designer. Um, gave me this uh, this picture here of how the pages will look. So he so he shows me these this, these grids here where there'll be a running headline. This will be the graffiti in the middle. Remember, I was talking about that on Wednesday. And then he shows some sample pages 
of how the thing's going to look. Um, and, uh, and then he sets out certain things like displays equations, and he, you know, he puts graffiti in there to, as an example, um, and uh, shows, shows his idea for displays. I should mention that this is a, this is a, a kind of a new idea for, for displaying equations. It's popular at MIT Press, um, not to center them. At, usually they're centered. And, uh, but they, he said, no, let's put all the equations, let's, let's, let's line them all up, um, uh, usually on the, on the same place where your paragraph indentation is, and that's a, sort of a design element in here. So you, so you, you run that through, or the, the, the exercises have a hanging indentation of that same amount, and, and uh, there's a, you know, all, it's, uh, it's something that, that unifies rather than, than disturbs the having different different amount everywhere. So, that's it. so they look for something, even though math, math equations have an awful lot of, uh, of variety, that he, want, there's, he wants some unifying feature, so he suggests putting them all over at the, at the point of the indent. But then you, some of them, of course, are lined up on an equal sign there. Um, so then uh, he, he uh, sketches out how he would uh, present an algorithm. If I had an algorithm, I don't think I do. Uh, he had to give, you know, showing various subheads and the and different uh, t choice of type that would be used here. Um, and, uh, now, and on tables, he, he, he specified, you know, the way he wants tables, he wants these rule lines to be a heavy rule at the top and another one below. Um, I, I over Speaking of rules, I overruled him a little bit. He wanted the table, the material inside the table, to be set in a smaller size of type, and uh, and it didn't work right with the exposition that I'm planning for this book. The table is really just as important. The stuff in the table is just as important as everything else, and so I didn't want it to have a smaller type in there. So I I just used regular type and so on. So he anyway he 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 first he sketches this out. Then he also provides something that uh, that that authors authors usually don't see because. Uh, they they send this out to some typesetting house, and there's all kinds of uh, of of, of, um, of arcane um, uh, specs in here. Table column heads nine slash ten computer modern C slash L C or Euler for mathematical expressions and numbers F L slash L over cowls of words, and you know flush left flush right uh, lined columns and all this all this got, uh, garbage. I um, uh, so nine on ten meant nine point type on, uh, with ten points between baselines, and I said I'm gonna, not going to go down to nine point type and things like that. But the, but uh, he's he, you know I got all these specs and um, and uh, that's because I have I'm doing the typesetting of this myself instead of instead of having it done by them. This is now that I'm doing it myself uh, means that uh, uh, I have a lot better chance of. Of, uh, of having accuracy in the book, and I can see how the how the formulas are going to break and things like that. Uh, the uh, uh, um, this, but but it, but I didn't want to give up the professional um, the the professional things that that book that uh, publishers provide the designer and the copy editor. So so uh, I so I didn't want so so I although I'm I'm doing the typesetting. I'm still sending it back to them for the services that they ordinarily would provide if somebody else was doing the typesetting. So I'm getting the services of their editor. I, then the copy editor, the copy editor is going to look over my thing, and, and then I'm going to I'm going to make the changes suggested by the copy editor myself. I'm doing it this way, Barry. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, considering all the other things you might be doing with your time, do you really think that doing your own typesetting is is a win? Yeah. Actually, it it takes very little extra. Time compared to what I was doing before. I, I I don't think that I'm that I'm less efficient now than I was when I was working with the uh, you know 20 years ago when things were going on by hand. Does that I keep think I'm probably more efficient pages per day. What? Does that keep the cost of the book down? And um, the cost of the, um, <laughs> the, 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 the cost of books are what people will pay. Uh, it has nothing to do with manufacturing cost. Uh, paperback uh, books sometimes cost more to manufacture than hardcover. Uh, like the, the, the tech book, for example, that, that binding that they put in this, the wire roll binding is a hand, is a hand job. It's harder to, it, it costs more to do that than to make the hardcover, but the hardcover sells for about $15 more. And, and it's because people, when they, when they, that's a, I mean, paperback book means something to, a, to the buyer saying that this, this means that we're, we're putting it out closer to cost and the, and the bookstore is getting a, a less of a markup on it and stuff like this. 
um, but it doesn't really mean that production cost is less. It's a, it's a big myth. Is that true for all books or just uh, books that are very popular, such as this, your own? This, the the uh, cost of books is is uh, amazingly low to, to produce them, uh, but they, but uh, there's many other costs: marketing, uh, warehousing, and things associated with them, getting them getting them out out there. I mean, uh, probably more of my books have been printed in the Soviet Union than than uh, and in China than in in uh, you know in the West. But um, I'm not sure if they ever get to people. <laughs> uh, they, well, they've been printed, but I'm not sure w what happens to them afterwards because the because you go into a bookstore and you can't find anything uh, uh, in those places. So um, uh, so there's a lot of other costs. You know, in order to do that job well, it takes it takes money too. So there's so manufacturing cost is a, is a, is, a, is, a, is actually a, a small part of the of the uh, um, uh, what a publisher does uh, also. But the manufacturing co there's a there's a there's a real neat book you can get in the bookstore called One Book Six Ways, uh, if you're interested in the pro in the process of making books. And 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 this was an experiment done by the University Presses of America about uh, 15 years ago, where they they decided to take a hypothetical manuscript that they didn't really uh, any of them wanted to publish, but each one of them put it through their whole design process and and and, and uh, estimate cost estimates and and uh, and and then um, and so they started out with the same uh, manuscript. A book on um, gardening, uh, indoor flowers, or something like that. And each one, you know, made a cover, and they and they and they produced uh, 16 sample pages, and you can get these these pages, and you can see all the correspondence that went back and forth between the different parts of the of the thing, and all the uh, estimates for manufacturing as to how much it was going to cost for different options with color and and uh, and, and putting it together, and then and then I. Uh, you got six different designs of the book and six different presentations, uh, working in different ways, different symbols for for uh, aspects of how much light and, and water a plant should get and things like that. And uh, it's, it's really it's really interesting to read. This is just a uh, it was a uh, uh, they they wanted to compare the the methods of MIT Press, North Carolina Press, uh, Stanford Press is in it I think I forgot sort of I should remember that one but I. There are six different uh, uh, houses, and, and you can see how you know if you want, if you want to know what book publishers do with it after they get a manuscript, this is definitely the best source. It's called One Book Six Ways, and it's a paperback that doesn't cost very much, less than ten bucks. <laughs> uh, okay, now where was I? I was answering some question. Have I answered it? <laughs> no, <laughs> no confused. Uh, face in front. Okay. Now, um, I don't want to give the idea that writing a book is all agony and pain. Uh, it, it, um, uh, there's lots of, there's lots of fun act too, you know, when you, when actually some things do work and you, and you do get, get, uh, get pleasure out of it. Uh, but the, uh, but it is work and people say how, you know, how do you ever write all these books that you write or something like that? And the answer is one word at a time. And, and, uh, uh, and sometimes the words are written over <laughs> several times, um, and so uh, you count the number of words, and you and you realize how, that it takes. You know, it's just um, a matter of being of being systematic about it. And um, uh, you read you read about people who do a lot of writing. I, I guess Jack London, for example. Uh, there's a there's a great autobiography about him. He was quite a character, um, turn of the century, and you can visit his house, uh, Wolf House, up. Uh, North of Berkeley, a little ways, um, that burnt down uh, a few a few days after it was built. But it was going to be one of the grandest houses in California. This was before Hearst was was, was around. Um, and uh, London um, was quite a character. Uh, but but uh, to make a long story short, he he wrote a uh, thousand words every day before coming down to talk to to his family or or do anything else. And he just he just made that a a rule that he would write a thousand new words in the um, and then when he finished that he would come and do the rest of his stuff and and uh, well that's um, you know 365,000 words a year uh, then and uh, and in the afternoon he might you know go over old words and and revise them or something like that but this was his this was a sort of a regimen that he carried out for 20 years and uh, a lot of great books came out of that. Okay. Um, now let's see. Uh, I, I marked this time. I'm a little more prepared. 
in so that I can be talking about things in, in this. There are, there are many things that changed between the before and after of my of the manuscript, but I wanted to point out sort of orthogonally different things or some, the different things that um, different issues that, that go on in this aspect of the of the editing. And one of them was um, uh, I said that uh, as you're reading this, uh, one of the main things you want to do when you're reading when you're proofreading your stuff is to is to think of is to try to put yourself in in the position of the reader. Uh, try to remember what the reader has been told so far, what the reader might try to guess, what the reader might expect to find next, and so on. Now, this, this is a, a hard thing to do. No, you, every reader is different, but you want to do that. You want to do your best anyway. And, um, and and I found, for example, at the last sentence here, the same thing holds if we shift the hexagon to any part of Pascal's triangle. As I was reading this through at speed, uh, it didn't it, it didn't come through. What what was what, what, I, what I'm really talking about here. And so I decided I would change the word saying the same thing holds if we extract such a hexagon from any other part of Pascal's triangle, instead of shift the hexagon to, uh, um, and, I, and I talk about such a hexagon instead of the hexagon, because it, it just wasn't clear, uh, you know, uh, but that the, the specifics of this isn't so important as the general thing is that, that as you're reading through, try to see if, if what you're if what you're saying makes sense to the to the reader who, who knows what he knows instead of the reader who was you when you wrote it and knew what you knew when you wrote it. That's quite a different person than the one who's who, who, who's coming up. So uh, although you although you revise um, in order to improve things, um, revision should get better and not get and not just get more more intricate more uh, uh, you, you can you can revise something to death and improve something and, and you know your improvements are building on it can only be understood by by understanding what what, what was there before the improvement uh, that's not uh, that, that's not so good it's, it's uh, uh, the, the the ideal result is to come up with something that seems so simple that it seems like it never had to be rewritten uh, this uh, this uh, this simplicity this uh, um, uh, instead of complexity after revision that's a uh, uh, that's a hard a hard thing to achieve. When I, um, <clears throat> I looked up um, in the dictionary to find out if you say replace with or replace by. And the dictionary didn't say. Uh, this just didn't give no 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 uh, um, uh, help on this. So I still so I still don't know. Uh, but here was a case where I def where I, I was saying, okay, the identity re reflecting this is, and then I wanted to change the sentence and say, obtained by replacing k by n minus k, um, and that's, uh, uh, I was giving a little more help before it, but then I realized I have by twice in that sentence, by replacing by n minus k, that's not so good at it. Uh, now I have to have by in there twice, and so, but I wouldn't say with, and so then I, you know, so then the answer was to to, to go to a different word by changing k to n minus k, and then I got, you know, that was it. Okay, so um, replacing. Now, uh, here is here is something where I, in the original, um, there was this displayed equation. And then, the, and then we were trying to figure out if it was true or false. Now, there's a danger in, an, in displaying an equation that's false because people are going to open the book to that page and they're going to look there and they're going to say, "Oh, here's a nice rule," and they're going to and they'll be able to prove that zero equals one and and they'll be they'll be uh, be able to get all kinds of corollaries uh, from 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 it. So so um, uh, so I wanted to to figure out a way to say that so it wouldn't look it wouldn't look uh, uh, too uh, too good. So I said, is something such true? Then it didn't read very good at, when I finally read it at speed. So then I said, is this a valid equation? And I say, no. And then, then the original said, for instance, when k equals zero, we get one unequal zero. Um, and now that didn't read well either when I said we get one unequal zero because it, we actually get one equals zero. We don't get one unequal to zero. So, so I rewrote it and said we get one on the left and zero on the right. Okay. So, so now, it, it sounded okay when I was writing it first at, at that speed I was writing, but when I was reading, it just much, it was much better. I, I needed something else, so I had to go to the other, to the other, uh, the other thing. Um, okay. Now, so at the, um, so keeping, trying to keep the reader to, uh, at, at tempo and things like that. These are the, these are the th things that you notice here. Here I had to refer to the equation. 
and I said, so minus one choose K equals this is always false. Um, I finally, uh, I had that, that didn't read too well either, so I put quotes around it. And this was this quoted thing was false. And finally, I put the word the equation. So finally, I say so the equation such and such is always false. Let's see, did that come out? How did that come out now in the in the uh, actual after? Um, here we go. So okay. So after the corrections were were made, uh, but the right side is zero because. Wait a minute. Yeah, we get one on the left and zero on the right. Um, and uh, so the equation such and such is always false. Ooh, exclamation point. All right. Well, I, permi I permit myself one every once in a while still. After all, we're talking about factorials. And, OK. Um, Okay. Now, another another thing that uh, that you find as you as you're reading through is that you is is that you have a chance to to move things around, um, present things in that there's a, a more logical order than uh, than than what what you had in your original manuscript. And uh, so here, for example, it says it uh, it um, uh, it follows. I'm going to talk more about that. It we've already used it here. Um, and it's not the same as this it. Uh, the, prep, the, uh, the antecedent of a preposition, of a pronoun, should, should be clear. And if you say it follows, uh, sort of meaning, um, you know, uh, as a consequence of, uh, then you have to be awfully careful that the it isn't confused in the reader's mind with some other it. Um, we call it an absorbent. So I say the, the identity follows from definition 5.1. But and then I but now, but here's the point I want to get it here, because both sides are zero and k less than zero. Otherwise, um, I, I, otherwise there's no argument. So so I have in definition 5.1. I, I I'm giving a proof here, and I'm and I'm talking about first about the case where k is less than zero, second about the the other case when k is not less than zero. But if you look back at definition 5.1. Um, lo and behold, first they consider the case k greater than or equal zero. Second, they consider the case k less than zero. So, so if you actually, you know, if you're actually looking at definition 5.1, uh, definition which is you're supposed to sort of have in mind or be, you know, there's a reference to it here. Um, our proof should follow the same order as, as as in there. So we should consider the case k greater than or equal zero first, and then do the otherwise case later. I think it, may, it made better pedagogical sense also to give the uh, to give the highlight of the, the the hard part of the proof first and get it over with, and then and wind it up quick um, uh, instead of easing into the trivial case of the proof, especially when that was the second part of the definition. So so here is this this you know two arrows meant uh, uh, really it's better to change this around. <clears throat> okay. Now next kind of a problem that I that I have here. Oh, by the way, Paul, are you taking notes today, or is there, uh, Tracy? Okay, I just want to make sure. Okay. Now, the next kind of a problem is uh, something that um, occurs only uh, when you're when you're near the end of the where you're near the end of the uh, uh, process, uh, and you and you assume that and you're going to pages that are, people are going to read, and, and you've got the text okay. But now, I found out that there was a bad page break here in the middle of a displayed formula. I'm starting a der derivation at the top of the next page. Uh, the thing the thing continues. See? At the bottom of that page, another one is um, uh, also I said open up. I wanted a little more open, uh, but uh, more space between lines. But but that one also uh, is, you know, is, uh, so so two. So these pages both broke in a bad place. So so definitely so so definitely I wanted uh, this to this to be in the middle of a page, you know, if I can solve the problem and get a, a nice page break to come in here uh, between, the, you know, before those of us who tend not to discover such slick proofs. Incidentally, I think that was a, or and I think that was originally tend to not discover, uh, but that's OK. <laughs> Maybe it's OK. But um, uh, anyway, tend not to discover such slick proofs. That's the ne that, that, that that would be nice if that came at the beginning of a page, because then we'd see this whole display and this next one would, would fall nicely, too. So what I need is something more. I got to do something more on the previous line. I got to think of something interesting to do now. Now, uh, as I said, in the old days when I wasn't doing the typesetting, um, the uh, page makeup man would would think of something interesting to say for me by displaying some equation 
that he would just choose uh, uh, he thought would be suitable for display and that would make up a few more lines and then uh, and then that would move move the copy around um, uh, now uh, um, however when I found out I was typesetting myself and I started doing volume two of the art of computer programming that was my first experience with this it was in seven, 1980 um, I found uh, cases where for, for example I, I needed about 12 lines of copy on one page so that on the next page I could get the algorithm and the table that shows that goes with the algorithm and the flowchart all facing pages and it would all look nice otherwise I'd have the thing split and, and a person would have to page back and forth in order to check the thing and so I needed I needed to figure out th um, 12 lines of something interesting to say on the previous page well, so that's a nice spur to research. I mean, uh, so I so I, I thought about it a little bit, you know, and I and I finally I came up with a, with a, with actually I think about 20 lines of, of good stuff, and I had to cut some other paragraph back because. Uh, but you know, you know, this is an incentive to, to prove more mathematics if you have to say if you have to say something um, interesting. Now, in this case, I couldn't think of anything more interesting to say here, so I did the, the, the so I so monkey around with the displayed equation, and so on this on, on this page, I decided to take this long display and and um, and make it more expository by breaking it into four four lines and say by symmetry and so on and and uh, you know sort of clinching the argument by by saying it by saying it longhand instead of by saying a shorthand and uh, now um, uh, this uh, the reader won't mind having this extra explanations in here and it gave me just the amount of space that I need so that when I get to the to the next page, uh, lo and behold, here it goes. Uh, it comes out nicely, and then the next, the next one breaks also, at a nice place. Okay, so um, uh, twiddling around with displays helps uh, helps a lot as far as as far as page breaking is concerned. And this is one of the advantages that math mathematicians have over people who aren't writing with a lot of displayed math uh, is that we that, that there is a lot of extra flexibility here if somebody's uh, if you've got a novel that's that's already been written by somebody and you want to avoid a um, you, you want to make it so that you know you don't get a, a line that stands you know stands all by itself at the end of a chapter or something like this um, uh, it's not so easy you got to you got to fudge some of the paragraphs make them looser or something or, or, or tight or something like that it's much easier with mathematics Okay. Uh, next point. The next point arises in uh, mathematical exposition. If you try to use a dash, um, a dash can, can can be confusing with a minus sign, and uh, so uh, although linguistically a dash might have been fine there, uh, it doesn't work out too well. So I put a colon, and then I said, by the way, we have thens in here. So so the Let's read the sentence. We found it by repeatedly expanding the bi binomial coefficient with the smallest lower index dash. Five, three, then two, four, two, then three, one, then two, zero. No commas were necessary. It was sort of fast then. But now I, I've got to slow it down in order to take out the dash and put, so, and put another word in here. So I say first five, three, comma, then four, two, then three, one, then two, zero. Then it wasn't, then there wasn't so, uh, you know, it wasn't um, uh, uh, so ambiguous. And uh, that the dash can certainly be confused with a minus sign. There are three kinds. There are four kinds, is it? Let's see. There's a, yeah. There's four kinds. There's a hyphen. Um, is a is a short is a short symbol. Then there's an n dash and there's an m dash, and there's a minus sign which is somewhere in between. Um, uh, so a hyphen um, uh, is uh, something that occurs like this repeating here, that little line after repeat there. See. So that's uh, that's the case for a hyphen. An n dash is a, is longer than a hyphen, and it tends to be used to, when you're talking about a range of things. Like if you're saying pages 10 to, to 18, that's an n dash that goes in there. Um, and uh, an m dash is what you use in a sentence um, for a dash. And uh, a minus sign is what you use in a formula. There are four, there are four different symbols, and they. Uh, and uh, they all come out looking about the same on a typewriter, but but uh, when you get into when you get into print, um, there there are these four. In fact, in the old days, they used to have they have used to have longer and longer dashes. I mean, Jonathan Swift he would he he had uh, uh, you, know, you know the length of the dashes uh, uh, would would have importance in his poetry. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> let's see. 
Um, now let's see. Uh, here's, where, here's a case where I had to correct the mathematics as I was reading it through. I, you can also, you know, not only catch uh, errors of English, errors of uh, typography and things like this, but you can also see that your, your mathematics is slipping. Uh, it helps to, you know, gives you a chance to do that. And, uh, and here I'm talking about zero to the zero. And, um, and, and I'm trying to make, make a point that uh, zero to the zero um, is definitely equal to one. And, um, and I'm talking, saying the functions x to the 0 and 0 to the x have different limiting values when x approaches 0. Um, now, as I'm reading through this, I realize that that's not correct. If x goes to 0 through negative values, uh, then 0 to the x is undefined. And so I, and so I, I you know, so I, re re I change the sentence to when x decreases to 0, and then, and then it becomes correct. It, then it's not, but it, then it's clear what the mistake is. <laughs> I say, well, but this is a mistake. Uh, it wasn't my mistake. It was their mistake. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Let's see. Um, I, what I'm saying here. Um, oh, uh, another case of reading at speed. I. Um, uh, here's a sentence, and when x equal minus one instead, when I when I read it over again, I didn't. It, it wasn't clear to me what what, it, what what this instead meant, and so I changed it to instead of plus one. Um, didn't hurt to add this to tell what it was instead of in minus one instead of plus one. I insert the redundant plus there in order to in order to emphasize the contrast between minus one and plus one, uh, and um, and put that in. So. So there's a, a trick of uh, again of, of exposition for at speed. <clears throat> the um, uh, the table here, um, as I'm talking this sentence, I found as I was reading it that I used. We'll see if you can catch what I was doing here. Let's look more closely at the values of n sub k and choose k when n is a negative integer. One would we'll approach these values is to use the addition law phi seven to fill in the values that lie above the numbers in table in table 5.1. What was the problem that I noticed as I read that sentence? <laughs> uh, we'll take you. Yeah, it's multi-value. Good, good, Barry. Um, yeah, I used values all the time uh, in there. It's the, it's the, so I changed this to entries. So, you know, they're table entries. So, OK. Um, uh, now, <clears throat> Here's a point that I wanted to make the other day, forgot, and it's, I think it's kind of important about present tense. Um, uh, but where is the reference? Wait a minute. Oh, OK. Appeared. This, OK. Now, <clears throat> here's a sentence. Um, it says, all of these numbers are familiar. Indeed, the rows and columns of this table appeared as columns in table 5.1, but minus the minus signs. <clears throat> Now, um, okay, I did several things to fix this up. First of all, I changed this semicolon to a period. So it's all these numbers are familiar, period. Indeed, the rows and columns, and then I say of table 5.2 appeared as, as columns in table 5.1, minus and minus signs. Now, um, so um, this is to stress parallelism. I talk about table 5.2 versus table 5.1. It makes it more parallel. But the, but here I'm, I'm focusing on the word appeared. Uh, yes, they, they appeared in, in that table we saw before, but they also are still there. I mean, that if you go back there, it's still there. Now, and, and uh, <laughs> I like skeptics, Barry. That's good. Enough. OK. Um, um, uh, we have some graffiti by a skeptic uh, in one of the. Um, now, uh, okay, so uh, and and especially what you should you, you you've got to use present tense about when you're talking about a fact that's sort of that's sort of timeless. So you don't say two plus two was four. You know, we 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 proved that two plus two was four in fourth grade. We proved it that two plus two equals four because it's, we, it's, it's a fact. It's, a, it's, a, it's something that's true for all time. And so you always use present tense for facts. Um, and uh, and in, in this case, uh, I, I, I think, um, you know, we're, the, the use of present and past, uh, you know, we, we looked at 
at at the things that that appear in table in the table, but they still appear there. They're still there. OK. Um, so so uh, I had comments about using using uh, um, tenses in, in, an, in a long paper where you can use future for something that's coming up later um, and past for things that have done, that happened before. But still, still, if they happened before uh, and they're still true, you still use present tense for them. And uh, and I added to the to the notes something I didn't say in class that day when that is uh, when, when you're using these you can also use verbs you can use, also use adjectives talking about about duration you can say we just proved it instead of, or we proved this long ago in chapter one or something like that uh, and we're going to prove something soon or we're going to prove something at, um, um, in a, in a minute uh, you got you got these extra little phrases to to uh, convey how far a distance there is back and forth that you that uh, uh, that go with this idea of, of time if you're considering your your discourse with the reader as a function as a function of time if you, if the whole paper is in present tense uh, you, you don't have a chance to, to use those but you have to say above or f far above or something like that and you still do something like that again yeah um, uh, well, uh, I, I don't know. I have to write another macro. But uh, um, uh, the table was fairly close back, and 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 they are consecutive through a chapter. But it, but if it were if it were if it were a remote reference, I would I, I, I would I would give a page number. It doesn't seem to make sense to both number the tables and num and refer to the page. Um, yeah, you you could well. Um, I see that I mean, this table and the table on page on the, on the table on page 211 or something like that could be done. Yeah, but uh, but this uh, it's yeah cross references are um, a problem. But I'm not going to do this with every equation. I mean, I, I give a lot of equations by number, and and I'm not going to. And, and uh, it's going it to really slow down the whole exposition if I if, if I had to give a page number for all that. Yeah, it's um, it's sure. easier to find equations because there's so many. You can see a page, and any page will have one right. on it. Then you know which way to go. But tables seem to occur so rarely that you can flip page, many pages and not know yeah. where, That's right. where you are. Mm -hmm. I've uh, just done there's an index I've, of tables. Something that beginning. I saw only once in an algebra text I used was all the tables were numbered. Um, in a 5, 312 for chapter 5, page 312. Ah, oh, that's interesting. That's neat. That's like freeway exits that, uh, you know, this is ex, ex, exit, exit 182. They do that. I don't know if they do that in California, but they do that a lot in, in the East. Yeah. OK. Yeah, go by the kilometer post or by the page number. Huh? OK. Sounds like a good idea. Um, <clears throat> Here's a place where I decided to transpose two parts of the text because the argument, because because the, uh, I, I decided that the, uh, the, I wanted to say two things, but the, the reader wanted this, wanted to know the second one first, the thread of the, the thread of the discussion. I, I'm just presenting a formula here, and then I, and the first thing the reader just wants to know, I decided, is why the formula is true, and. And secondly, that the formula is really useful. Uh, uh, I can, uh, I, you can, you can count on him to think that it's going to be useful for a minute anyway, and, and then you can, then you can stress its usefulness later on in applications. And so I decided to switch these two parts around. And so, and so, um, uh, let's let's look at before and after here. So I present this this law here. People who've taken 260 have this rule called negating the upper index. Um, which is a transformation of binomial coefficients. Okay, and it says it's particularly valuable because it holds without any restriction, paren, except that the lower index must be an integer so that the binomial coefficients are defined, close paren. So here we're, here we presented the law, but we don't, we might be hanging saying, I'm not sure, I believe it. Uh, but then um, w w immediately we're talking about it being valuable because of such, ex of why it's valuable except for a recent, you know, so we weren't quite ready for that much yet. Um, uh, so uh, and and the name of it and so on. So and then it's then finally come to the, 
it is easily proved since now we give this this um, uh, and I got to talk about breaking displayed formulas later <laughs> but this didn't fit on a line obviously and so we have to we have to do something about about m making that in, in, in two lines well uh, so rewrite to try to present it better so here it goes the general rule uh, which has been motivated by all these numbers being familiar <laughs> is easily proved since such and such happens when k greater equals zero and both sides are zero and k less than zero. Now I get to, now I get to, to, to uh, press in the point that this is w really worth knowing in case it slipped by. It's particularly valuable because it holds without any restriction of source, what? <laughs> of course. Is that a malapropism? Or how do you change the S and the C? Um, had a, had dinner with my editor the other day. We were talking about farmers. For some reason, we, the, the phrase we, "weeded and reap" came up in our in our uh, <laughs> discussion. Uh, I got a I got a very I got a very good editor. So, okay, now um, okay. Of course, the lower index must be so. That, all right, so. Um, um, now, uh, also, that parenthetical remark was what was removed from the tail end of the previous sentence. The, the original sentence had it there before the period, except at the lower index and so on. But this, this putting it in a separate sentence uh, keeps it less com keeps it less complicated. What we're doing, we get to the period, and we, we actually said something. Then we're ready for a little exception to the rule. Um, then uh, the transformation is called negating the upper index. But how can we remember this important form and so on? Okay, now, um, now uh, here's a um, uh, another advantage of, of, of the idea of, of graffiti. Uh, I was able to throw in a few places uh, suggestions that it's a good time now to go to the end of the chapter and look for a, look at a certain exercise that everybody uh, that everybody would, you know would, would be wise to warm up with on this point. And. Uh, uh, okay, so that's ghostwritten graffiti here and there. Uh, this is real graffiti down here. This is reassuring, but it can also be frustrating. So, okay, now <clears throat> another mathematical point on this page. Um, I had a formula here where I, where the right hand side was minus a fraction, and that minus sign could get lost there next to the fraction bar. So I changed the I, so I changed the equation and wrote r over two minus k instead of k minus r over two on the left hand side. I, I, I get a fine identity and uh, without the minus sign on the right. Okay. So you get a chance to rearrange mathematical formulas to make them more easily read. Now, of course, when I do that, I have to change it here too because I'm referring to the factor, and uh, I got to remember that I, you know that that uh, uh, if I made some references to it elsewhere, I have to have to convert those references. Question. Yeah. Uh, on the integrals that you have there, I'm yeah. curious as to the convention. Some people put the uh, lower bound to yeah, the left. The, the lower instead limit. Instead of sometimes, okay. There's there's some people like them like them this way. I never saw it that on that side. Really? No, I, I mean I what like this? Yes. Really? Where do you yeah. come from? Where, where, is that so? <laughs> hey, I didn't know that one. Oh, okay. I, so I never. That's, you're saying the that's interesting. Is either on the bottom. That would really that would really mix up with stuff that comes up in front in, in front there. I think that would that would. Uh, but but putting it putting it way under and way over is a is a house style. You know, it's a style that you adopt throughout a book for displays on, on integral signs. You decide whether or not you have have uh, uh, limits at the right of an integral or or up and, and bottom. This one takes more more space. But if you don't have so very many integral signs, it might might be easier to easier to read them. It takes less horizontal space. It takes less horizontal space, right, which so you can you can you can uh, get long you can get wider formulas in there. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And for multiple integrals and things like that this can happen. Right. Okay. Um, I change I did edit this to say I wanted to use alpha instead of A here. The the A was was conflicting with something else in the uh, in the text, and, and I didn't realize when I wrote the draft, I, I patched this in later, so I changed the letter alpha there, but that's another point. Uh, let's see, another advantage of graffiti is that I could every once in a while quote 
an original source when somebody discovered when some, now this is Leibniz writing here when he discovered the he, he discovered trinomial coefficients and um, and so uh, I mean he's talking about um, uh, you know thinking cogitating here you know and m miraculous rule mirabilum regulam you know for the for the for the coefficients of a power not only the binomial but also the trinomial and so on into a polynomial and the, and uh, the comprehensive and so on you know it's possible to assign a number of coefficients. So he's discovering the trinomial theorem here. I thought that was a nice graffiti to put in uh, because this is a letter that he wrote to Bernoulli when he when he discovered this. And uh, and so I get to use this. Uh, and, and every once in a while I have a uh, uh, found where where the uh, uh, the first occurrence of, a, of an important uh, thing in mathematics uh, is recorded in its in the original language. Okay. You cite that. It's yeah yeah you, no you see this unfortunately this uh, the graffiti macro doesn't have a a, a way of of, uh, of going to the next page and I didn't know where it would fall on a page you know and so and so uh, uh, this and everything is changing here this is my very first output so I so uh, some of the graffiti will fall in the wrong place but when you finally get the when when you finally get the real the real one uh, yeah it'll it's it's got a reference to Leibniz and is and is uh, and then the 86 will be the, re the letter to Bernoulli uh, on such and such a day, found in such and such a collection of Leibniz's Schrift. And do you have some of the graffiti running off onto the other page? Is that why you have them facing one another? Uh, the actually, that never happens. Uh, they're, they're always short enough that that uh, that they can be positioned. But I have to position that by hand. Why did you choose to have the graffiti facing? One another on the respective. Oh, the um, uh, the book designer chose that. He decided that that would be the better, the best way to do it. I think it. I think it's a win after looking at it. But, but it surprised me when I first saw his his idea. Okay. Uh, but this is a this is a, a aspect of the book style that I I guess uh, uh, comment a little about that. That is. Um, uh, I never wrote a book that had that had a graffiti column before, and um, so as I'm writing the book, I'm trying to get the f feeling for what it li what it's like to live in that kind of a world, and what what uh, how, how can the book be better uh, uh, because this is there, uh, and not uh, I don't want to overdo it, but I want to find you know find find the things that this allows me to do that I couldn't do before, and uh, some of them seem to definitely be wins. And as as you go through, and here I am in chapter. Five. I'm finally realizing something, you know, that, that that I can put into the previous chapters. And you, and, and when I was writing the first few pages of chapter one, I had no idea what this was going to be like. I was just, I was just playing around. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you rewrite is because it's like why you rewrite an operating system. You, you find out that as you're using the operating system, uh, you want other features that you didn't think of when you when you were designing it. And it's the same with uh, with the book. You you want other, you, you you learn how to you, you sort of develop a style for for that particular book. Each book is a bit different, um, and you get to learn the style. If you're writing a novel, you, you get to learn your characters. They they they, they take a their personality blossoms uh, as you as you uh, think about them more. Uh, the guy who illustrated the textbook said that uh, that um, this lion that he was drawing. Um, he kept learning more about the lion as he, you know, after and and he would go through a whole pass of doing 40 drawings of it, and then this, then come through again, and then he would know he he could really this became a, a sort of a person in his mind. These things take shape in the same way a style of a of a document takes shape uh, as you as uh, as you write it. Okay, um, well I got time for one more, um, and that is about breaks. Between um, no, let's leave that till Friday. Covered a lot today. Any other questions? Okay, I th I'm planning to have a, ho a homework that you will enjoy doing next week, but I haven't figured out how to do it yet. <laughs>